after defeating Jello and preventing a catastrophe that could cost many lives. The story continues with Natsu and his team returns and finds that the guild has been completely rebuilt with a new design, including an open-air cafe, a souvenir shop, a pool, an amusement center, and everybody is now allowed to access the second floor. While the rest of the team is amazed with the new guild, Natsu frets, saying that the guild doesn't feel the same. The guild master, Makarov, then arrives and introduces the group to a new guild member, Juvia Loxer. The team warmly welcomes Juvia and thanks her for her help during their battle in the Tower of Heaven. Makarov is satisfied with the team's reaction and introduces another new member, Gajo Red Fox. The team are overwhelmed to see the face of their former enemy who destroyed the guild, but Makarov ignores this and tells them that he was only acting on Jase's orders as a loyal guild member. While Lucy sees Levi cowering at the sight of her former attacker, Natsu approaches Gadjil and begins to argue with him. Despite Gadjil's past actions, Makarov believes that he is not a bad guy. However, Makarov agrees with Urza that he should be monitored for the time being, to make sure he is not a spy. The lights are suddenly turned off and Mira Jane begins to sing to her guildmates and all the guild members enjoy her beautiful song. However, Mira Jane is interrupted when Gadjil accidentally steps on Natsu's foot, causing the two to fight and begin an all-out guild war, which is only stopped when Makarov, knowing that the reporter from the Sorcerer magazine will be visiting the guild the day after, uses his giant magic to scare his guild members. Gadjil is later confronted by Jet and Droy, who still haven't forgiven Gadjil for his past actions. Angered that Gadjil has joined the guild after having destroyed it during the guild war, Jet and Droy begin to attack him, while Levi tries to tell them to stop from the sidelines. Though Jet and Droy continue their assault on him, Gadjil refuses to defend himself or fight back. Just as the two stop to ask him why he isn't fighting back, Laxus arrives and begins to pulverize Gadjil as well, blaming him for destroying the old fairy tale building and further ruining the guild's reputation. As Laxus attacks Gadjil with his lightning magic, Jet, Droy, and Levi try to stop him, after realizing that Gadjil didn't defend himself since he wanted to be recognized as a fellow member of fairy tale. Irritated by the team, Laxus attacks them with a bolt of lightning. As it is about to hit Levi, Gadjil shields her, much to everyone's surprise. Gadjil then leaves, saying that he has work to do. An angry Laxus leaves as well and, with his tolerance at its limit, promises to himself that he will have fairy tale. Meanwhile, when Lucy finally returned to her apartment after a mission in the Tower of Heaven, she should be relieved because she can relax. However, in reality, Lucy is feeling anxious because usually Natsu and her fellow guild members enter her apartment without permission. However, when Lucy found nobody in her apartment, she's quite surprised. Even so, she was finally relieved because she can sleep well without being disturbed by Natsu or Happy. After taking a shower, Lucy intends to sleep. However, how surprised she was when she found Natsu and Happy sleeping on her bed. Lucy immediately kicked them out of her room. But, Happy informs her about Miss Fairy Tale Contest, a female beauty contest which will grant the winner 500,000's jewel, and Lucy decides to take part. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the Dark Guild Ghoul Spirit is annihilated by three fairy tale mages, Free Justine, Bixlow, and Evergreen, who's revealed to be the Thunder God Tribe, Lax's personal bodyguards, which readies to return to Magnolia for an unspecified plan machinated by their leader Laxus, who's seen waiting for them in town, claiming that Makarov's reign as Guildmaster is over. The next day, Makarov himself is making preparations for the Fantasia Parade alongside Mira Jane. When she comments that it would be good for Laxus to join in, since she has been told by Levi that he's in town, Makarov remembers when Laxus was younger, as a kind boy who was proud of his grandfather and wanted to join Fairy Tale. Makarov wonders what changed Laxus and made him into his current self. The festival finally begins, and the first event is the Miss Fairy Tale contest, with Lucy hurrying towards it and Juvia being revealed as a participant too. One of Fairy Tale Guild members, Max Alors acts as the announcer and presents the contestants one after another. Kana first appears and uses her magic card to infatuate the crowd. Juvia then uses her water magic to charm the crowd. Afterward, Mira Jane ruins the mood by doing a few weird transformations but when Urza uses her re magic, the crowd gets back in the mood. Levi then appeals to the crowd and also Biska Mulan as well. When Lucy finally begins her act, Evergreen suddenly appears, claiming to be the rightful winner, and turns Lucy to stone through the use of her stone eyes, revealing to have done the same to all the other contestants, much to everyone's dismay. Laxus and the rest of the Thunder God tribe appear as well before the shocked eyes of the other guild members. Laxus states that they'll be playing a game to decide the strongest in fairy tales, and that the petrified girls will be kept as hostages to prevent their guildmates from breaking the rules of the game. Natsu seems to approve of the contest, gets ready for battle. Natsu, excited, charges towards Laxus, but is struck and knocked unconscious by Laxus' lightning in an instant. 
Evergreen goes on to explain that their fellow fairy tale mages will have to find and defeat Laxus and the Thunder God tribe in three hours, or the girls will meet their demise. Having announced these things, Laxus and his bodyguards disappear, and their guildmates start leaving the place, rushing around to search for them in town. Makarov tries to leave as well, but finds that he is incapable of doing so, with the area having been previously surrounded by one of Freed's enchantments, preventing stone statues and those older than 80 years from leaving the enchantment. Makarov is then forced to remain behind while his guild members search for Laxus and his bodyguards. Afterward, Makarov asks Redus, who remained behind since he was afraid of Laxus, to find the witch, poor Yusika, in the East Forest, since she may have a cure to release the girls from petrification. In that very moment, Natsu wakes up, and, spurred by Makarov to go and defeat Laxus. Natsu rushes towards the enchantment, but finds it impossible for him to leave due to Freed's barrier, despite it blocking the exit only to those older than 80 years and to stone statues, with Natsu not belonging to either of the two categories. Meanwhile, the first battle between comrades takes place, with Alzak being forced to fight and defeat Jet and Droy in order to escape one of Freed's barriers, and keep searching for the opponents to save Biska. Fights between comrades to escape Freed's enchantments rage on everywhere in town, with Makarov looking on as more than half of Fairy Tail is defeated by internal disputes, and Natsu trying to leave the barrier to join the fray, despite still considering Laxus a comrade and a member of their guild. Elsewhere, some guild members run across the Thunder God tribe, Redus, prevented from leaving the town by one of Freed's enchantments, gets to meet the leader of the tribe himself and faces defeat at his hand, while Grey is pitted against Bixlow. Grey is fighting Bixlow in a shop, with neither of them managing to gain the upper hand on the other. Having revealed that, through his Seath magic human possession, Bixlow can freely change the containers for the souls he employs in battle. Bixlow manages to draw Grey in an alleyway, where one of Freed's barriers is revealed, preventing those inside it from using their magic. Grey, unable to use Ice Make, suffers heavy damage from the blasts Bixlow's dolls fire to him from the outside, and is defeated, much to the dismay of Makarov, Natsu, and Happy. As Grey is easily defeated by Bixlow, Laxus, through the use of a thought projection, appears before Makarov, Natsu, and Happy. He expresses wonder at the fact that Natsu actually thinks he's bluffing about killing the prisoner girls, and says that, with both Natsu and Urza out of the way, none of the members can stand up to his Thunder God tribe. Upon hearing that, Makarov decides to surrender to Laxus, asking him to stop the whole thing. However, Laxus says that, in order to end the battle, Makarov has to resign his position of guildmaster in his favor, stating that he has just an hour and a half left to do so, before the petrified girls crumble to dust. Laxus states all Makarov has to do is to give the announce to the loudspeaker. When Natsu tries to attack his thought projection, it disappears. Makarov claims he wouldn't have problems giving up his title, but that Laxus isn't the one he can trust it to. Yagil suddenly shows up and readies to go after Laxus. But, much to his and everyone's dismay, he finds himself incapable of passing through Freed's barrier too. Elsewhere, having defeated Elfman, Evergreen is shown having defeated a large amount of fairy tale members. At the same time, Freed appears before an injured Alzok who uses Gun's magic, tornado shot against Freed, but the opponent easily cuts through it with his sword, and then defeats him due to the conditions of one of his barriers, this being to deprive those who use magic inside it of oxygen. With only Natsu and Gajo left, but confined within the barrier, Natsu thinks they should depetrify Urza, believing he could do so with his fire, much to the other's alarm. He opens up a crack on Urza's petrified face, but the results are good, as the girl is then freed from her stone prison, with her punching Natsu for burning her. She was freed due to her magical eye having absorbed half of the offending magic. This way, one more fighter for Fairy Tail joins the fray, and rapidly followed by another, Misto Gun who makes his appearance as well, readying to take part in the battle. With the appearance of Urza and Misto Gun, Laxus comments that makes the three top mages of Fairy Tail. While running around the city, Urza is confronted by Evergreen, who express wonder at her having gotten free. The two start fighting, with Evergreen bombarding Urza with her fairy magic and Urza dodging and counter-attacking with her swords. Evergreen believes herself to have gained the upper hand due to the immense amount of needles produced by her fairy machine gun, but Urza starts wielding a pair of swords, in addition to the two she's already using, with her toes, managing to pin her opponent to a wall. When Evergreen states that, through her stone eyes, she could potentially destroy the petrified girls remotely. But Urza requips her heaven's wheel armor and a vast amount of her weapons, claiming that, if her friends are to be killed, at least she'll avenge them by making Evergreen suffer to the death. This reveals Evergreen's bluff, and the girls are turned back to normal, with Laxus enraged. Laxus angrily wonders why Evergreen lost, and Freed, having said that either he or Bixlow should have confronted Urza, says that, with the hostages freed, the game is over. Laxus intimidates him with a lightning attack and states it's not over, telling Freed not to chicken out now, as he'd have no place in his guild for such weaklings. 
Back at Fairy Tale, the depetrified girls are seen talking with the others in an atmosphere which gets more and more relaxed. However, such relax is broken by the former communication from Laxus, through the use of Freed's enchantments, that, to keep the game from ending, he has activated the Thunder Palace, which will activate in an hour and ten minutes. This greatly shocks Makarov, who falls ill and is tended to by his guild members. However, Mira Jane calls them out and shows what the Thunder Palace is, an enormous amount of thunder-filled lacrima orbs, capable of creating a lighting storm strong enough to destroy the whole town of Magnolia. Biska equips a sniper rifle and takes down one orb, but is then electrocuted and knocked unconscious through the organic link magic cast on the orbs, which makes everyone who attacks them feel the blow as well. An enraged Natsu cries for Laxus to stop and tries to get out of Freed's barrier, while Laxus says that's a battle and won't be over until one side is obliterated. Levy suddenly appears, saying that, due to Freed's magic being written, she might be able to find a way to nullify the barrier, allowing Natsu and Gadjil to go after Laxus. While Levy works to decipher the rune magic in order to nullify the barrier, Kana and Juvi are seen searching around for Laxus. Laxus angrily orders Freed, who believes they have gone too far, to take care of Kana and Juvia, to which he reluctantly agrees. While Urza is tricked by Evergreen into entering a male bath, believing Laxus to be there, Lucy and Happy try thinking of a way to evacuate the town without scaring the citizens. In that moment, Lucy is assaulted by Bixlow's dolls and being saved from their beams at the last moment by Happy. Bixlow appears on top of a nearby building and, having exchanged words with Lucy, has his dolls start attacking her again. Lucy summons Sagittarius, who destroys Bixlow's dolls. Despite initially feigning despair, Bixlow reveals that the building he's standing on is a toy shop, and his souls take on new bodies and attack Sagittarius, forcing the celestial spirit to retreat and then steal Lucy's other keys, rendering her helpless before their subsequent Baryan formation. However, Lucy is saved by Loki's sudden arrival, with the celestial spirit having forced open his gate to save his beloved owner. The two ready to fight Bixlow together. Bixlow's dolls attack them, but Loki takes them on, and Lucy, with Happy's help, rapidly reaches Bixlow and manages to hit him with her whip. Bixlow resolves to remove his visor, revealing his figure eyes, which allow him to turn the ones who look in his eyes into dolls and to control their souls. This forces Lucy and Loki to close their eyes, leaving them open for Bixlow's dolls to attack them. When Loki suggests Lucy send him away to summon forth Horologem and shield herself, she answers that she trusts him, which prompts Loki to use his lion brilliance, emitting intense light from his body, which forces Bixlow to momentarily close his eyes. Lucy takes advantage of the moment as she's told by Loki, using her whip to grab Bixlow's neck, allowing Loki to defeat the second member of the Thunder God tribe with his regulus impact, stating that Lucy granted him strength with her love. After the battle, Loki gives Lucy back the keys stolen by Bixlow's dolls. At the same time, Levi manages to decipher Freed's enchantment, and opens a path to the outside for Natsu and Gajil, who are ready to join the battle. Meanwhile, Mira Jane runs into the injured Elfman and, as she helps him on his feet, starts crying and begging for his forgiveness for never fighting alongside him and the others, to which he says her smile after battles is more than enough. Elsewhere, Kana and Juvia meet Freed and, while running after him, are trapped inside one of his barriers, with this one allowing exit only once one of them is unable to fight. Juvia turns herself into water and, unwilling to attack Kana, strikes the Thunder Palace's orb above her, severely injuring herself but dispelling the barrier. She states that she didn't want to injure a comrade, wanting to be acknowledged as a member of Fairy Tale, which prompts Kana to tearfully recognize her as such. Juvia passes out, with Freed surprised by the fact that she chose a comrade over herself, and Kana readies to fight him while tearfully screaming out his name in anger. Concurrently, Elfman and Mira Jane reach the place where Kana is fighting Freed, and witness Kana's defeat at Freed's hands. As Elfman readies to fight, Freed claims that, having already lost to Evergreen, he has no right to continue the game before starting to torture him with his dark magic, with Mira Jane crying and begging him to stop. As Freed readies to finish Elfman off with dark magic, Mira Jane remembers Lysanna's death, and, not willing to let another beloved sibling of hers die, manages to use her takeover, Satan's soul. She then attacks Freed and readies to engage him in an aerial battle. Freed uses dark wings to enable him flight and evade Mira Jane's claws. She turns her head, looks at him angrily and speedily charges at him once more, this time managing to claw him twice. Freed flies away and Mira Jane gives chase behind him. Freed decides that he has no choice and that only a demon can master a demon. He casts dark magic, darkness on himself so he may become a demon. Their fists meet, the magic power release destroying the ground around them, and they proceed with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Their darkness charged fists and feet clash for a short amount of time until Freed is overpowered and they crash into a cave. In the cave, Mira Jane attacks him with evil spark. Freed uses darkness breath, a tornado of dark energy, against Mira Jane. They are later both out in the sky again. 
Freed follows up with Darkness Flare Bomb that sends Mira Jane flying into the river. Much to Freed's surprise, Mira Jane gathers the water of the river around herself. Freed wonders in shock as to how much magic power Mira Jane actually has. She casts Evil Explosion and throws the whole river at Freed. Mira Jane quickly follows up with more punches and kicks. She casts Soul Extinctor on him and blows him away, sending him down to the ground. His darkness spell has worn off and Freed is back to his original form. Mira Jane, unmerciful, punches him and pins him to the ground. Freed thinks that he can't possibly defeat Mira Jane with her powers like that and he's going to be killed. However, just as Mira Jane is about to deliver the final blow, she stops her fist from connecting with Freed's face and reverts to her original form. Freed asks her if she's pitying the defeated and yells for her to finish it. She tells him that they're all allies, fellow members of the same guild that smile together and laugh together. Freed insists that he only has one ally, Laxus. Mira Jane tells him that that's not true and that he must have realized. Momentarily, Freed remembers moments in the past when the fairy tale mages were really friendly with him. Mira Jane takes his hand and tells him that when he reaches out, there's always someone right there. She states that it's when people realize how lonely it is on their own that they start to become kind, which causes Freed to start crying. In his sniffing, he tells her that he didn't want to do any of that and Mira Jane comforts him by saying she knows. With a smile, she tells him that they should all enjoy the Harvest Festival next year. Meanwhile, Natsu is shown searching around for Laxus, while Gadgil instead is seen communicating through a Shikigami with an unspecified master, stating that, once he's done with Laxus, he'll also have to take care of Natsu and the whole of Fairy Tail. At Fairy Tail's building, Levi is thinking about what should be done while poor Yusuka shows up, demanding to see Makarov. Once before the unconscious master, she tells Levi to bring Laxus there, as Makarov hasn't got long to live, with tears in her eyes, much to Levi's extreme shock and dismay. Meanwhile, Laxus is reminiscing about his younger days inside the cathedral. He remembers one debate he had with Makarov, in which he confessed that he was fed up of being recognized as the master's grandson, scolding Makarov for having expelled his father, Ivan Dreyar. Ivan had been expelled for bringing harm to his fellow guildmates, but Laxus had been unforgiving and threatened to leave Fairy Tail to join his father's guild. Before leaving, Laxus swore that he would one day be stronger than Makarov. Laxus then returns to the present, in which he castigates himself for thinking these thoughts. As he's thinking about such things, Misto Gun makes his appearance. Laxus is happy to see him, being willing to fight him to decide who's the strongest mage in Fairy Tale while Misto Gun demands that Laxus deactivate the Thunder Palace. They get into an argument on who is stronger. Misto Gun inquires of his source, and Laxus states that he may reveal it, if he is defeated. The battle officially begins and Misto Gun is the one to make the first move. Misto Gun proceeds to use his skyscraper spell on Laxus, who manages to soon reveal it to be an illusion and breaks it afterwards. The two continue exchanging spells without managing to hurt one another. Suddenly, Natsu and Urza appear, surprising Misto Gun and Laxus takes the chance to strike him with his lightning, damaging his mask. Under it, Misto Gun's face is revealed to be the same as Jello Fernandez. They are both left speechless, and Misto Gun apologizes to Urza saying he didn't intend for her to know. He claims to know Jello, but does not be him. He apologizes once more and disappears, saying he will leave fighting Laxus to them. Laxus sees this as another opening and hits Urza with a lightning bolt, which momentarily debilitates her. Natsu starts his battle with Laxus. They both deliver hits, but utterly ineffective ones. At this time, Urza recovers from the shock and decides to fight Laxus using her lightning empress armor. She also demands Laxus cease his thunder palace, but he won't, not until Makarov resigns, ignorant of the fact that Makarov is terminally ill. They continue attacking each other with their lightning magic. At this moment, Natsu asks Urza to let him fight Laxus, and she concurs in order to leave and destroy the Lacrimas. Natsu and Urza reconfirm their belief in each other, and Urza goes out and summons Blades, wanting them and the spirits of her friends to help her. This silent plea of hers is felt by Grey Fullbuster, Lucy and Happy, all of whom run to get everyone. Grey, in particular, has a plan. He wants to find Warren, the guild member who has the ability to do telepathy, in order to call everyone in Fairy Tale and ask them to help Urza. With this in mind, Grey runs throughout the city. Urza is summoning more and more blades, and this is visibly tiring her. However, she doesn't let go, she continues summoning, ready to hit the Lacrimus. Back at the cathedral, Natsu and Laxus's battle rages. They both attack forcefully, but no one seems to be gaining the upper hand. Furious, Laxus unleashes a big bolt of lightning, and Natsu is knocked down. Laxus still thinks of the Thunder Palace, and wonders why his grandfather hasn't resigned yet. Natsu tells him not to be concerned as Urza will take care of it. The battle between Laxus and Natsu rages on, with both beginning to get serious. Urza equips all of her 200 swords, and a newly awakened Grey, through the use of Warren's telepathy manages to coordinate his fellow guild members. 
All of them attacked the Lacrima Orbs at once, destroying the Thunder Palace and suffering the electrical after-effects, but surviving. Upon knowing that, Laxus, enraged, and goes all out. He rapidly overwhelms Natsu and is on the verge of killing him when Gadgil appears and saves him. The two reluctantly team up, but, despite their best efforts, they don't manage to severely hurt Laxus. Even their combination of Fire Dragon's Roar and Iron Dragon's Roar leaves the opponent unscathed, as Laxus suddenly reveals himself as a fellow Dragon Slayer, with Lightning as his element. With the two opponents exhausted, Laxus, completely out of his mind, readies to annihilate the entire Magnolia town with Fairy Law. With Laxus readying the spell before Natsu and Gadjil's shocked eyes, Levi suddenly appears, telling Laxus that Makarov is on the verge of death and begging him to stop such madness, but Laxus instead smiles defiantly and laughs off the matter, stating that his chances of becoming master have increased. He then proceeds to cast Fairy Law, but, much to his dismay, finds it incapable of hurting anyone in town. An injured Freed appears to explain that because, in his heart, Laxus still considers them comrades and Fairy Law only hurts those the caster considers enemies, his spell failed. Laxus unwilling to acknowledge that and remaining enraged as his fight with Natsu continues. While he's on the verge of finishing the boy off with Lightning Dragon's magic, Gadgil uses his iron body as a lightning rod to draw the attack towards himself. With Laxus having used up almost all of his magic power, Natsu bombards him with a barrage of attacks and then manages to defeat him with his exploding flame blade, putting an end to the Battle of Fairy Tail. Everyone in town is shown unaffected by the battle and even oblivious of it, happily enjoying the festival. Afterward, Poryusika leaves the town, and Urza announces that Makarov's life isn't at risk anymore, to her cheering guildmate's happiness. Meanwhile, the fire dragon that Natsu had been searching for all this time, Igniel, is seen residing in a volcanic region, talking to the dragon named Grandini, about Natsu. Igniel immediately orders Grandini to leave, while she warns him that if Natsu continues fighting as recklessly as he has, he may wind up dead. Igniel then makes a reference to the black wizard, Zeref, and the dragon's removal from human affairs. He then shows that he is in fact very firm about leaving humans alone, especially Natsu. Sometime later, Lax's sudden appearance shocks everyone, as the S-Class mage demands to meet Makarov, with Urza hushing up those who want to stop him and showing him the way. Natsu comically confronts Laxus, but he shrugs the matter off by waving his hand, something which seems to positively impress Natsu and Urza. Laxus proceeds to meet his grandfather in the nursery room. After a valuable lesson concerning what a guild is truly meant to be, and having told his grandson that all he wanted for him was to be happy, Makarov excommunicates Laxus, his tears reflecting the grief in his heart for having no other choice. Laxus leaves, thanking his grandfather for everything he has done for him. Having bid farewell to his Thunder God tribe and having convinced them to remain in the guild, Laxus is seen watching the Fantasia parade from a distance. Makarov raises his hands up in the air with the index stretched, followed by all of Fairy Tail's members, a gesture from Lax's own childhood, with the instance being shown, another Fantasia parade. This symbolic gesture shows Laxus that, even after all the trouble he has caused, everyone will always be watching over him. Bursting into tears of regret, Fairy Tail's former S-Class mage walks away. Shortly afterward, Gadgil is shown talking with the unspecified master from before. It is revealed to be none other than Makarov's son and Lax's father, Ivan Dreyar, master of the Dark Guild Raven Tail. Later, at Fairy Tail, it's revealed that Gadgil is a double agent, who was tasked by Makarov into finding out Raven Tail's location, something he achieved. Thanking him for his help, Makarov states he won't let his son have his way and get his hands on Laxus. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Altir, who managed to survive after the Tower of Heaven incident, is seen telling important things to her master, Hades, through a round green orb. Altir reveals herself to have been manipulating Jello all along, as Zeref was never killed and just sealed away. Her true goal is to unseal the dark mage Zeref, and using Jello to get one of the keys needed to release him. A week later, everything seems to have settled down. Lax's excommunication came as a surprise for everyone and Makarov himself would have resigned his position to take responsibility for his grandson's crimes, but Freed told him that Laxus would have felt bad if he had known. Makarov then tells his guild members that Laxus' dragon slayer powers are artificial and stem from some lacrima. The Thunder God tribe is starting to make friends in the guild, and Urza wonders about Misto Gun's identity. Sometime later, Lucy looks gloomy because she doesn't have money to pay her rent, while she can't get rid of the feeling someone is watching her. At night, when she's walking home, Lucy runs across the hooded man who was following her, who's revealed to be none other than her father. Having lost all of his fortune, Jude states he wanted to see his daughter. However, his true intentions are soon revealed, with him wanting to borrow a hundred jewels from Lucy in order to start a new activity at a merchant guild in a Califa city. Lucy doesn't have that amount of money, and her father gets angry and shouts against her, prompting Lucy to send him away with tears in her eyes. 
Arriving at her doorstep, Lucy met Natsu and Happy who were waiting for her. They seemed to be worried about Lucy because she had been looking down because she felt someone was stalking her. Not only Natsu and Happy, Grey is also worried about Lucy and is secretly watching her from a distance to protect her from her stalker. Lucy was relieved and touched because her friends really cared about her safety. She also feels very grateful to have friends who care about her so much. The day after, Team Natsu is leaving on a profitable job, when Lucy overhears some people talking about Love and Lucky, the merchant guild her father wanted to join, having been taken over the by Dark Guild Naked Mummy. Lucy renounces the job with her team to go and save him, despite him being a terrible father. Lucy reaches the place and rapidly gets rid of the Naked Mummy members through the aid of her celestial spirits and saving the hostages. However, her father is nowhere to be seen. Jude then arrives after Lucy has saved the guild, having been forced to walk all the way there due to his lack of money. He thanks his daughter and reveals that guild is the place where he first met her mother and where she got pregnant with her. He also states that her own name, Lucy, comes from the guild sign, Love and Lucky, which at the time was missing the K in Lucky, thus reading Lucy. The rest of Team Natsu suddenly appears, and Lucy leaves with them, with her father happy to see his daughter surrounded by friends and grown, and silently apologizing to his deceased wife for what he did. Later, in Naked Mummy's headquarters, the one who lead the assault to the Merchant Guild is beaten up by Gato, who needs the cash to pay their senior Dark Guild oration says, with his fellow member, Zato, stating they'll have to find another way. Meanwhile, in another place, the first member of the infamous oration says, Cobra, appears, stating that it's time for the light to be crushed. Because Lucy suddenly went to a caliphate to save her father, Team Natsu lost the profitable job, so they took a job as the waiters at an aid island. At least Lucy can pay her house rent with the wages from the job. After helping Lucy get her rent, Team Natsu meets up with Yajima, the owner of the restaurant, whom they learn from about the dissolution of the old magic council. Afterward, fairy tale members learn of the powerful association called Balam Alliance and their plans of destroying a major portion of it, specifically the one under the Oration Say's control, through an alliance with other legal guilds. Makarov tells Team Natsu that they will join their fellow mages from Blue Pegasus, Lamia Scale and Kate Shelter, thus creating a team in order to stop Oration Say's in their tracks. Meanwhile, Altir, revealed to be a member of Dark Guild Grimoire Heart, and informs her master Hades of the Oration Says and their movements, with Hades resolving to leave them be for now. Elsewhere, though, six members of the Oration Says watch the effects of something they refer to as Nirvana on the land itself. Upon arrival at the meeting place, the three members of Blue Pegasus Guild, Hibiki, Eve, and Ran, quickly show off their so-called handsomeness and treat Urza and Lucy like hosts. When their leader, Ichi Akatabuki, tries to get close to Urza, though, she kicks him away, and he subsequently gets his head frozen in ice by the arrival of Leon. Lucy then meets Sherry once again and the two seem to continue their rivalry, along with Grey and Leon, with all of them being soon stopped by Lamia Scales Ace, as well as one of the ten wizard saints, Jura Nikis. Leon and Sherry have joined the Lamia Scale Guild and will cooperate with them on this mission. The group waits for the final member to show up, the one from Kate Shelter, and is surprised to have a little girl named Wendy Marvell and her cat companion, Carla, to join them. Happy immediately develops a crush on Carla while Natsu tries to remember where he heard Wendy's before. With all the guild members assembled, they learn of the oration say searching for a powerful magic called Nirvana, with little known info about each of its six members. Before a true plan can be set up, though, most of the alliance runs out, searching for their enemy. As only Ichiya and Jura left behind, Jura is attacked by the former, who actually turns out to be Gemini, celestial spirit serving Angel, one of the members of the oration says, with the real Ichiya having been beaten up badly. Having infiltrated their meeting, Angel now knows about the alliance's planned ambush. With 10 of the 12 members of Allied forces still searching for the Oration Say's base, the airship Christina, which they were planning to use in their battle, arrives overhead but is suddenly blown up. The surprised Allied forces are then greeted by the Oration Say's themselves, who made the first move. Happy, Wendy, and Carla hide behind a rock, while everyone else tries to fight back. However, they are rapidly and effortlessly defeated by the six, with everyone lying on the ground, and Urza ending up lethally poisoned by a large serpent during her brief scuffle with Cobra. The Oration Say's leader Brain then prepares to finish the mages off with his dark magic, but is overly surprised in noticing a frightened Wendy hiding behind a rock. Brain proceeds to kidnap her, recognizing her as the Sky Sorceress. Happy mistakenly gets carried away with her while Brain readies to finish off the downed allies before departing. However, they are saved by Jura, who's having arrived with Ichiya. Ichiya proceeds to use his healing perfume to heal everyone's injuries, but is surprised to learn that his magic can't stop the poison that Urza is infected with. Urza then asks someone to chop off her poisoned arm, which Leon tries to do and nearly succeeds before Grey stops him. 
During the argument, Carla calms everyone down by saying that Wendy can save her without the need for unnecessary sacrifices, since she is the Sky Dragon Slayer, capable of employing healing magic, much to everyone's dismay. Realizing that they need Wendy's help, everyone now agrees that their new mission is to find and rescue Wendy and Happy from the Oration Says. Meanwhile, everyone splits up to try and find Wendy and Happy. Lucy remains with the downed Urza and Hibiki. Natsu, Grey, and Carla are searching for their friends. Natsu asks about Wendy's Dragon Slayer magic and learns that Wendy volunteered for the mission just to meet him, and that the Dragon Grandini, who taught and raised Wendy, disappeared about seven years ago, just like Igniel, the dragon who raised Natsu and Metalakana, the dragon who raised Gagiel. The group is subsequently attacked by the Dark Guild Naked Mummy, who they ready to fight. Elsewhere, the other groups of allied forces run across other Dark Guilds subject to Oration Says. At an abandoned city, Brain tells everyone that Wendy possesses healing magic and that they can use her abilities to heal him, much to their dismay, and with Cobra commenting that they had rapidly find Nirvana. Brain tells Racer to go fetch him, and for Cobra, Angel, and Horai to search for Nirvana. Soon after, Racer returns to the headquarters carrying a large, cross-shaped coffin, and the person in it is revealed to be Jello Fernandez, seemingly in a comatose state due to Ethereum's effect, and whom is said by Brain to know the location of Nirvana, having once been a member of the Magic Council. Happy and Wendy are both surprised to see Jello still alive. Outside, Natsu and Grey are briefly shown fighting and having defeated Naked Mummy, and trying to extort its top members the location of Oration Sei's base. The other members of Allied forces obtained victory as well, with the exception of Ichiya, who was captured. Afterward, Aragor appears as an ally of Oration Sei's and blocks Natsu and Grey's path after they defeat all the members of Naked Mummy. Aragor states that he has gotten more powerful and has been waiting to fight Natsu again. They proceed to fight, but he is defeated shortly afterwards, and being knocked unconscious. Back inside, Happy tries to convince Wendy not to save him due to what he did to Urza, but Wendy, further terrified by Brain threatening Jello with a dagger, says that she loved him and owes him a great debt. She is then given five minutes by Brain to make up her mind. When Natsu, Grey, and Carla have reached Oration Say's base, Natsu's screams prompts Racer, on Brain's order, to go outside and assault them. Grey engages him in combat while Natsu and Carla reach the cave their friends are in. Upon arrival in the cave, Natsu was very surprised to see Jello well and alive, after Wendy having healed him. Natsu rushes against him, but Jello rapidly takes him out with a spell, unexpectedly doing the same with Brain, and then leaving. The group leaves the place to go and heal Urza, with Carla carrying an unconscious Wendy and Brain, thinking that Jello wants to keep Nirvana all for himself, orders Cobra, from a far place, to follow him. The confrontation between Grey and Racer continues, and, as Carla and Happy carry Natsu and Wendy away, they are spotted by Racer, who rushes towards them and had knocked them out the air. Natsu catches all of his unconscious friends and runs. Just as Racer is about to catch up to them, Grey prevents him from continuing the chase with Ice Make, Rampart. Natsu makes a run for it, and Grey continues his battle. Elsewhere, Jello is shown having knocked an Aragorn member unconscious and robbed him of his clothes, and, as he leaves wearing said clothes, he whispers Urza's name to himself. Meanwhile, at the Fairy Tale Guild headquarters, Makarov and Mira Jane are shown discussing the results of an investigation about the Oration Says related to the Tower of Heaven. Upon learning that, they hope Team Natsu and the Allied forces can complete the mission and survive. As Natsu runs away carrying his unconscious friends, he is contacted by Hibiki through the use of his archive magic, with which he sends Natsu a map to find them. He then explains the mechanics of his magic to Lucy, who glad to know Wendy's safe, swears she'll protect Urza until the little healer arrives. Meanwhile, Racer renounces to chase after Natsu, stating that he wants to kill Grey, who stopped him in his tracks twice. After displaying his astonishing speed, he uses Dead Grand Prix to summon forth many armed motorbikes, on which he and Grey start a chase, exchanging blows. The two run across Leon and Sherry, and Leon joins the fight on Grey's motorbike, destroying Racers with Ice Make, Eagle. Racer responds by destroying their motorbike, and then start dodging all of their Ice Make spells, expressing surprise when the two remove their shirts, true to their strange habit. Avoided all of their attacks, he hits them, and states he'll finish them off. However, Leon tells Grey he has found Racer's weakness. Grey and Leon confab a bit, and then Grey is suddenly and unexpectedly blocked in a very high pillar of ice by Leon, who states he doesn't need him, and that the glory this time belongs to Lamia Scale. Leon and Sherry then ready to fight Racer, but Sherry is rapidly taken out by Racer. Before he can be struck too, Leon uses his ice make magic to cover himself in ice spikes, stating that Racer won't be able to hit him, and claiming that his fatal weakness is his low offensive capability while trying to lead him away. However, Racer breaks through Leon's ice and rapidly hits him several times. He then draws a knife and points it at Leon's throat, stating that, with his speed, all that he needs to finish opponents off is that knife, with which he can cut their throat open. 
However, Leon's reveals to have truly fine racer's weakness. His magic doesn't enhance his movement speed tremendously, but instead slows down the perception of time for everyone in a given area aside from himself, making it seem like he moves at unholy speeds. In that moment, Gray is shown breaking free of the ice pillar with a bow in his hands, capable of seeing Racer clearly from such distance. As Racer realizes that everything was part of the two's plan, Gray shoots his arrow. Remembering his prey to be faster than anyone, Racer is defeated by the ice attack. Racer, unwilling to accept his defeat, raises on his legs and reveals an explosive lacrima device strapped to his chest, charging forth to take Gray's life alongside his own. However, Leon pushes Gray aside and tackles Racer, with the two of them falling off the cliff while the lacrima explodes. Gray forms ice stairs to go examine the site of the explosion and search for Leon, whom he sure can't be dead. Meanwhile, Sherry starts to act strangely, wondering who is to blame for her beloved one's apparent death. Concurrently, Natsu hears the explosion, and so does Brain, incredulous that the Allied forces managed to take the life of an oration says. Angered, he wakes Midnight up and orders him to eliminate all of their opponents. Meanwhile, Jellal is shown walking in a strange place, with Cobra following him without him realizing. The oration says member wonders why he can't hear his thoughts. Jellal is then shown having stopped before a large tree, with chains protruding from it. Much to Cobra's enthusiasm, Jellal destroys the tree, and a pillar of light is released from it. Afterward, Natsu reached Lucy and Hibiki, and, having been awakened from her state of unconsciousness alongside Happy and Carla, Wendy goes on to heal Urza from the poison, at the same time wondering whether Jello really did Urza the terrible things they told her. Wendy finishes healing Urza, much to her comrade's happiness. However, such joy is interrupted by the sudden appearance of the light column from the ground. Elsewhere, Jura is shown fighting Hodai, who assaults him by surprise, their earth magic, respectively making the ground hard and making it soft clashing as Hodai wonders which one is stronger. But their fight also is interrupted by the sudden appearance of the light column. Back to where Jellal is, Cobra rejoices, as from the beam of light, which is seemingly starting to gather darkness from the surrounding area, a tower peeps out, Nirvana. Everyone is shocked to see Nirvana appear, with the powerful magic making communication via archive magic between Hibiki, Eve, and Rand difficult. Realizing that Jello must be where Nirvana is, Natsu rushes in that direction, willing to stop him so that Urza doesn't have to meet him again, but she concerned seems to overhear, slowly opening her eyes. Hibiki tells Lucy they should go after Natsu, but the group notices Urza has disappeared. Wendy starts crying, stating that the whole matter is her fault, for she was the one healing Jello, and Hibiki unexpectedly attacks her with a spell, much to the others' dismay. Lucy's group is then shown running in the same direction as Natsu, with Hibiki carrying an unconscious Wendy on his shoulders, claiming that he had to do that. He tells the others that he knows what Nirvana is, but didn't tell everyone back at the meeting since it might have brought doubt about his loyalties. Nirvana is a spell that makes people switch between light and dark, and what they just saw is the first stage that makes people who waver between good and bad switch places, which is why he knocked out Wendy when she was having doubts. Not only Wendy, Sherry also seems to have been affected by Nirvana. This is shown when Sherry, who is traumatized by Leon's supposed death, readies a doll attack, wood doll and uses it to attack and knock out Grey. Similarly, Hodai, after his seeming previous crisis from before, is shown turning good, stating that he wanted money simply because his goal is to find his long-lost brother. He hugs a surprised Jura, stating they should put an end to his evil comrade's plan of using Nirvana and teach them what wonderful thing love is. With Lucy's group running towards the Pillar of Light, Happy brings up the fact that, if the alignment-changing ability of Nirvana is true, then those belonging to the Dark Guilds will switch to good. Hibiki says that's a possibility, but claims that, if Nirvana were to activate its second stage, then it could be used to target specific people such as a guild, and its members would go on a killing spree, much to Lucy's dismay. Hibiki claims they have to stop Nirvana, or the legal guilds in the world will be destroyed. As Natsu continues running, he spots Grey, seemingly lying unconscious in a river. Natsu rushes toward him, but is lured onto a raft, and is almost killed by Grey before being saved by Lucy and the gang, with Sagittarius shooting an arrow to stop Grey. They at first thought that Grey had turned evil due to Nirvana, but realize that he is an imposter as he starts listing data about them. The imposter then poses as Lucy and lifts her shirt, up which makes the guys happy and trouble Lucy. She later tells Sagittarius to shoot Hibiki, and when Lucy forces close Sagittarius' gate and tells Carla to take Wendy somewhere safe, the fake Lucy resummons Sagittarius to shoot Carla and Wendy out of the sky. Before she does, Angel shows up, revealing herself as a celestial spirit mage, and the imposter is revealed to be Gemini, the same celestial spirit who attacked Jura and Ichiya. Realizing that everyone else is incapacitated, Lucy has no choice but to fight Angel herself. She summons Aquarius to fight, but Angel responds by summoning Scorpio, Aquarius's boyfriend. Neither chooses to fight and they go on a date. 
Angel then scolds Lucy for not knowing the relations between her spirits. Lucy resorts to using her trump card Loki, but Angel summons Ares, a dear friend of Loki. This greatly shocks Loki, Lucy, and Hibiki. Angel proceeds to explain that she was the one who killed Hibiki's former girlfriend, as well as Loki and Ares' former master, Karen Lilica, and took Ares from her. This is Hibiki almost succumbed to Nirvana, but he seemingly manages to stifle. Lucy tries to dismiss Loki instead of having him fight Ares, but he refuses, since they were summoned by different people and have to fight for their master's sake. Loki quickly gains the upper hand since Ares isn't a combat spirit, so Angel summons Kalem and ruthlessly shoots through Ares just to reach Loki, revealing that she can summon two spirits at a time. Angel's act of cruelty greatly horrifies Lucy. Due to the damage from Kalem, both Loki and Ares are forced to return to the celestial spirit realm to heal. Before they completely vanish, Loki apologizes to Lucy, and Ares says she's happy he found a kind owner. Enraged, Lucy summons Taurus, but Angel resummons Gemini who poses as Lucy, distracting the charging spirit, and uses Kalem to knock out Taurus. Without any energy left, Lucy begs Angel to release Ares from her contract in a final act of desperation. Lucy claims she deserves happiness together with Loki. Angel agrees, and declares that the price for Ares' freedom will be Lucy's life. Angel orders Gemini to kill her, but Gemini manages to feel Lucy's love for celestial spirits and cries, saying they can't kill her, greatly angering Angel and prompting her to close Gemini's gate. Hibiki suddenly appears and grabs Lucy's neck from behind, prompting both her and Angel to believe that he has fallen prey to Nirvana. However, this is just an act to trick Angel, and he tells Lucy that he is going to transfer a high-level spell into her head through his archive. Lucy is shown entering into a trance and reciting an incantation, as Angel angrily charges towards her wielding Kalem. Angel angrily charges towards Lucy wielding Kalem, but she enters a trance and recites an incantation, casting a high-level spell against Angel and defeating her. Lucy is shown waking up from the trance seconds after, oblivious of what just happened. Lucy notes the presence of her companions, and then rushes toward Natsu. However, Angel suddenly rises from the water and tries one final attack to take down Lucy with Kalem, but fails. She then faints as she remembers her prayer of fading into the sky like an angel. Although her attack failed, she did make the raft Natsu was on sale down a waterfall, with Lucy having boarded it to protect her friend, and the two fall over together. Elsewhere, Brain is incredulous that Angel has been defeated too. He states he won't let the deaths of his comrades to go to waste, and that he'll crush the light. However, in the river, Angel is shown floating, alive and claiming she's not dead. Afterward, Urza is shown running in the woods, while reminiscing the time spent with Jellal and wondering what he's doing in such a place. Meanwhile, Carla has brought Wendy in a safe place, and she proceeds to tell her the story of her encounter with Jellal. Long time ago, they happily traveled together for a month after Wendy was strangely left behind by Grandini. One day, Jellal pronounced the mysterious word, Anima, which prompted him to leave Wendy at Kate's shelter, stating that traveling further with him would have been too dangerous. Wendy states that she still believes Jello to be kind despite all of his seeming bad actions and she wonders whether he still remembers about her. Urza is shown arriving at Nirvana's location, where she finds Jello. The two meet, much to the still-hidden Cobra's dismay, and Urza is surprised to learn that Jello has lost all his memory except for the her name, something which reveals to Cobra why he couldn't read his memory. Jello asks her if she knows something about his identity and about Urza, something which fills her eyes with tears. She then proceeds to tell him that she is Urza, and lists everything he did in the past, something which makes Jello deeply sad, since he can't believe what he has done. In the meantime, Lucy wakes up to find her wounds treated and her body clad in a different outfit. It is revealed that Natsu also got a new outfit by Virgo, who passed through her own gate since Lucy was out of magic power. Later, Sherry appears and tries to attack them, but she is tackled from behind by Grey. She finally reverts to herself when Leon appears alive and well, having survived the explosion, much to everyone's relief. Meanwhile, Wendy and Carla are surprised by the fact that Nirvana's black light when it turns white, and Happy is shown dragging Hibiki out of the river, hoping everyone is alright. Back at Nirvana, Cobra reveals himself and asks Jello how did he manage to discover the magic's location and why he unsealed it, to which he responds that was the doing of a voice in his dreams, which made him remember the magic's whereabouts. Jello then reveals that he unsealed it in order to destroy it by a square of self-destruction on Nirvana. Cobra tries desperately to obtain the spell's deactivation codes, but to no effect. Jello then reveals to have cast the spell on himself as well, being willing to die to make amends for his sins and to free Urza of his burden, taking her sadness away with him. Urza, however, rushes towards him with tears in her eyes, calling his name. Urza cries for him not to die, as he should remember everything he has done and make up for it living. But unexpectedly, Brain appears behind them and reminds him that he's, in fact, the one who taught Jello the spell in the first place, before rapidly nullifying it, much to Cobra's joy. 
Nirvana's second stage is finally activated, and the magic reveals its form as a gigantic building moving on six large spider-like legs. Urza and Jello manage to cling on the structure, while Natsu and the others look panicked and scared to see the appearance of Nirvana which destroyed the area around them. They are shown to have hang on to Nirvana's legs. Natsu starts suffering from motion sickness and falls, but is saved by Happy's sudden appearance. Despite Jello's depression for not having stopped the magic manages to convince him to deactivate the suicidal spell, Urza showing him her comrades, who are clinging on Nirvana's legs too, ready to confront Oration Seis and stop Nirvana. She says they'll never give up, being connected through hope, and spurs Jello to live on and see the future with his own eyes. While the others climb the legs, Natsu and Happy fly to the structure's top in order to access it immediately. Inside, Brain shows Cobra the city of the ancient lying in Nirvana, and then takes control of the building and readies to move it towards a certain guild. However, Natsu suddenly appears, and Brain orders Cobra to attack him. Cobra and his large serpent companion, Cubelios, hit Natsu and Happy several times, with the reptile being revealed to possess wings, which allow him and his master to fly. Natsu attempts to attack Cobra, but finds it impossible to hit him due to Cobra hearing all of his thoughts. Natsu continues his aerial battle with Cobra, and only manages to land blows on him when he stops thinking while he attacks. Having found a worthy opponent, Cobra transforms his arms into Dragon's Claws, revealing himself as the Poison Dragon Slayer, much to Natsu and Happy's dismay. Meanwhile, Wendy and Carla find out, much to their shock, that the direction Nirvana is heading to is that of their guild Kate Shelter. At the same time, Grey and Lucy meet up with Jura and Hodai. Having been reassured that Hodai isn't bad anymore, they listen to his story about the Nervin the neutral tribe which, in order to obtain peace, created Nirvana 400 years ago. As they discuss, Midnight suddenly appears before them. Hodai then tells his newly found friends to leave and find Brain, as he readies to fight Midnight. Having landed some blows on Natsu with his claws, Cobra has Cubelios produce a poisonous mist from his mouth. Having consumed it, he proceeds to use Poison Dragon's roar on Natsu and Happy, poisoning both of them. Cobra then goes on to make a distinction between old-style and new-style dragon slayers. Natsu belongs to the first category, having learnt his magic from a dragon, and Cobra to the second, having implanted dragon lacrima inside his body to gain dragon slayer magic, much like Laxus. He proceeds to declare new style dragon slayers as the true ones due to dragons being extinct, despite Natsu angrily stating that Igneal is alive. The two continue to fight, and Natsu, with both he and Happy severely weakened by Cobra's poison, asks his friend to let him go. Cobra hears his thoughts and finds out Natsu wants to use his fire dragon's roar. Having jumped and grabbed his head before he can do so, however, he readies to smash him on the ground below them. As they fall, however, Natsu roars out extremely loud like a true dragon, something which it's heard throughout Nirvana. With his superhuman hearing, the roar acts as a powerful attack against Cobra, who falls to the ground alone, seemingly defeated, much to Brain's dismay. Natsu and Happy, exhausted, fall to the ground as well, with Natsu's motion sickness appearing. However, Cobra, again on his feet, appears before them, and readies to finish Natsu off. Before he can do so, however, he's shot in the back by Brain. Cobra hears Brain's thoughts, with the Oration Say's leader thinking that, if they can't defeat such an average guild, his underlings are nothing more than trash. Remembering his prayer to hear the voice of his friend Cubelios, Cobra falls unconscious to the ground. Natsu angrily chastises Brain for doing such a thing to a comrade, but Brain shrugs it off, stating that he has taken an interest in Natsu and that he'll make him his first puppet through the use of Nirvana. Meanwhile, Hodai is shown to have seemingly defeated Midnight. Midnight believing that if he loses, his father will abandon him, tries to run for it, but Hodai uses a combination of his heaven's eye and liquid ground to spot Midnight and attack him again, stating that Oration Says will end today. Ray, Lucy and Jura catch up to Natsu and Happy, with both of them being too exhausted and weakened to put up a fight against Brain, who's dragging Natsu, also afflicted by his motion sickness, away. Oration Say's leader states he'll make Natsu a subordinate of his using Nirvana, which will soon reach Kate's shelter, something which shocks everyone. Jura asks Brain why he's moving Nirvana towards that guild, and, when the other doesn't answer and mocks them, he rapidly attacks him with his powerful earth magic, much to Brain's dismay. Jura goes on to say that he won't let Brain sleep until he reveals his goals, while Grey and Lucy watch on in surprise and admiration. Jura and Brain engage in a brief battle, with Oration Say's leader attacking the wizard Sank with his darkness magic. Jura uses his signature iron rock wall to parry all of Brain's attacks, and then rapidly proceeds to defeat Brain with Supreme King Rock Crush. Brain wonders how they lost, as that man promised them that they'd never lose. When Grey notes that the lines of Brain's face are disappearing, Wendy and Carla manage to reach them. Meanwhile, Midnight is shown rising on his feet again and rapidly defeating Hodai, claiming that now he's a mage stronger than his father. 
Brain, still lying on the ground, notes that five prayers have already disappeared, and only midnight is left. Wendy uses her spell to momentarily eliminate Natsu's motion sickness, and the group resolves to stop Nirvana, which, despite Brain's defeat, is still moving on track towards Kate's shelter due to Midnight's presence. In Kate's shelter, Master Roball is informed of Nirvana heading towards them. He states that they should trust their allies still fighting out there, and that, maybe, it's time for them to make amend for their sins. Meanwhile, the ones on Nirvana try thinking of a plan to stop the building from reaching Wendy's guild, with Wendy herself running away on her own, stating that she might have an idea. Ode seemingly communicates telepathically with the group, stating that they'll find Midnight under the throne room, and that stopping him will stop Nirvana. However, this is revealed to be a deception, with the one having sent the telepathic communication being, in fact, Brain. When Natsu, Grey, Lucy and Jura reach the indicated place, they are caught in a huge explosion. At the same time, Urza and Jellal are seen hearing the explosion. Soon after, Midnight appears before them. Jellal tells Urza to stay back, as he readies to fight Oration Say's most powerful member. But Jellal is rapidly defeated by Midnight, much to Urza's dismay, who is left alone to face him. Urza realizes that Jellal's defeat is due to him having used up a lot of magic power with the Square of Self-Destruction. She attacks Midnight with a pair of slashes, but finds it impossible to hit him, with the sword's direction changing as she strikes. Midnight then proceeds to magically strangle Urza with her own armor, which tightens, immobilizing and disarming her. She manages to break free of it, and requips her Heaven's Wheel armor. Midnight then proceeds to explain the nature of his magic, Reflector, which has the power to twist and distort anything. Distorted attacks can be redirected to the attacker, and distorted light gives birth to illusions. Urza sends many swords flying at Midnight, but he deflects them all, strangles Urza with her armor once again, and dodges another sword thrown at him by her, before striking Urza with his spiral pain and heavily injuring her. Midnight explains to Jello why they chose Kate Shelter as the first guild to destroy. Surprisingly, the Kate Shelter guild members are the descendants of the Nervet who created Nirvana, and thus the only ones capable of resealing it. As Midnight rejoices at the thought of the Nervet slaughtering each other due to Nirvana, Jello says he's disgusting. Midnight replies that Jello isn't better than him, and that he has caused a lot of suffering to many people. He then invites him to join the oration says. However, Urza raises back on her feet, a new armor equipped. At the sight of the explosion, Natsu, Grey, and Lucy are shown to be almost unscathed. Jura protected them with his iron rock wall, taking all the brunt of the explosion on himself. He says that he's glad they're safe before falling unconscious, with the three running up to him. Meanwhile, while tending to Jura's wounds, Natsu, Grey, and Lucy are surprised to see Brain's staff, Kladoa, talk and declare itself as the seventh member of Oration Says. Kladoa then explains to Team Natsu why they chose Kate Shelter as the first guild to destroy, as explained by Midnight. Urza and Midnight continue their fight, and, this time, Urza rapidly gets the upper hand, striking Midnight different times, due to the weaknesses of his magic. Reflector doesn't work on human bodies, and it can only refract one area at a time, either the one around Midnight's body or the one around the enemy. Urza claims the victory is hers, but Midnight laughs, stating that, at Midnight, which is ringing in that moment, his powers reach their peak. He then transforms into a large monster, attacking and stabbing Urza and Jello. However, this is revealed to be an illusion of Midnight's reflector, useless before Urza's artificial eye. Urza finishes the last member of Oration Says off with a slash, and Midnight falls unconscious, thinking about his prayer to fall into slumber in a quiet place. Natsu, Grey, and Lucy are shown engaging Kladoa in a clumsy battle, with the stick hitting them around. However, Kladoa realizes that all of the Oration Says have been defeated, and this terrifies him, because now Brain's alternate, devious personality who loves destruction, Zero, will now be released. This proves to be true, as Zero himself makes his appearance on the scene, rapidly and effortlessly taking out Natsu, Grey, and Lucy. He ruthlessly kills Kladoa himself, and then readies to fire Nirvana against Kate Shelter, to satisfy his eagerness for destruction. In the meantime, Wendy and Carla reach Jellal and Urza, and Wendy, not being recognized by him, is informed that he has lost all of his memories. Afterward, Zero fires off Nirvana on Kate Shelter, with Master Robal resignedly stating that such is their fate, to reckon their heavy sins. However, the blast misses by a margin due to the sudden appearance of the Christina airship, flying again, and with the other members of the Allied forces on board. Hibiki, through the use of his archive magic, proceeds to communicate his allies on Nirvana how to stop the wandering building. They'll have to destroy the six lacrima crystals empowering it, each placed in a different leg, in 20 minutes, before Nirvana can fire again. Shortly after, Zero sends a communication to everyone, stating he'll be waiting at one of the Lacrima Crystals to defend it, making Nirvana's destruction difficult. There are, still, only three mages left to fight, and Wendy claims to possess no offensive ability. 
This problem is solved, however, when Natsu, Grey, and Lucy, spurred by their companions, stand on their feet again, ready to accomplish their goal. Natsu chooses the Crystal 1, Grey chooses 2, Lucy chooses 3, Ichiya goes for the Crystal 4, Urza takes 5 and then gives the task to destroy Crystal 6 to Jello, stating that Natsu still believes him to be evil, and that for now they shouldn't let him know about Jello. As Ichiya moves with difficulty towards Crystal 4, due to him being still tied to a pole by a dark guild, Natsu reached Crystal 1 and readies to fight Zero, who's standing there. Elsewhere, before they split up, Urza reveals that it was likely for Zero to be at Crystal 1, due to Natsu having an excellent nose and boundless will to fight, and that he'll be able to handle the matter. As she pronounces Natsu's name, however, Jello appears shocked, a wicked expression taking shape on his face as he walks away. Natsu engages Zero in combat without managing to hit him, and instead being struck himself numerous times by the opponent's darkness magic and by his physical blows. Jello suddenly appears and blasts Natsu with a spell, having seemingly returned to his evil personality. However, Jello instead reveals that he sees Natsu as a fire of hope, proving to be still good, and reveals him that he has lost his memories. As Natsu, angered, attacks him and reprimands him for his past actions, Zero uses his dark magic against them, and Jello steps before Natsu, taking the brunt of the attack on himself, reminding the latter about the same thing Simone did for Urza in the Tower of Heaven. Having fallen to the ground, Jello offers Natsu some golden fire to consume and to revitalize him. Jello tells Natsu that even though he could not remember his crimes, he could not be forgiven for them, and that Natsu had to defeat Zero. Meanwhile, Wendy is shown at Crystal 6, with Jello having asked her to destroy the crystal in his place, because with the young girl too exhausted to use her healing magic, Jello decided to go and heal Natsu himself. Remembering Jello's kind encouragement, for her to eat the heaven through her dragon slayer powers in order to obtain offensive power, Wendy readies herself. At Crystal 3, a down Lucy, who states she has no magic power left to destroy the crystal, is surprised to see Gemini sudden appear. The Celestial Spirit, turning into herself, offers Lucy her help in destroying the crystal. At Crystal 1, Natsu finally accepts Jello's flame, with the latter stating that he believes in the man Urza believes in before passing out. His fire spell proves to be extremely powerful, as, consuming it, Natsu enters Dragon Force, much to Zero's dismay, who had now been struck by Natsu several times. With Natsu commenting that the sensation is the same as when he ate Ethurian, the two resume their battle. Natsu and Zero continue their battle, and, despite the former's dragon force, Zero retains the upper hand. As Natsu's comrades get ready to attack the respective crystals, praying for Natsu to be safe and to do it in time, Zero brutalizes and badmouths Natsu, stating that he can't beat him, the leader of Oration says, on his own. Natsu, however, rises on his feet, stating that he's not alone, because his comrade's power is running through his body. He then charges towards Zero, readying to use his exploding flame blade against Zero's ultimate attack. As everyone readies to attack the crystals, Natsu and Zero clash, the latter's genesis Zero seems to overwhelm Natsu, but Natsu manages to literally devour it using the golden flames he was granted, and then reveals an astonished Zero the true power of a dragon slayer, roaring out loudly as the image of an imposing dragon appears behind him. Natsu proceeds to hit Zero, and finishes Oration Sei's leader off with his phoenix blade, sending him crashing through the Lacrima crystal just as his comrades attack theirs, thus destroying Nirvana. Following the destruction of the Lacrima Crystals, Nirvana starts to fall apart, and everyone tries to make it outside. Wendy and Carla are saved by Jura, while Natsu and Jello are saved by Hodai. With everyone safe, the gathered group has introduced Jello and told that he lost his memory, despite his past, evil deeds, having helped them out, he's considered a friend. During a private conversation, Urza and Jello reconcile, with she telling him that she'll be at his side to help him while he gets back his memories, and Urza tries to add something, but is interrupted by the arrival of the Council's 4th Custody Enforcement Unit, led by Lahar. He explains that the Council has now been restored, and that they are here to capture certain criminals. The army starts with Hodai, for his past sins as an Oration Says member, despite him having been turned good by Nirvana. Jura tries to speak against them, but Hodai decides to be arrested since he can never be rid of his sins even if he turned good. Before Hodai gets taken away, Jura tells him that he will continue the search for his younger brother in his place, and asks for his name. Hodai says his name is Wally Buchanan, and Urza, surprised, instantly tells them that she knows him, and that he is alive and well, traveling across the continent with his good friends. This makes Hodai burst into tears, and realize that there is hope for those who believe in the light. He is taken into custody with no regrets or worries. Lahar proceeds to tell them that they are after another person, even more dangerous than the oration says, Jello. For his crimes of infiltrating and destroying the council, as well as firing Ethurian, he's to be arrested. 
when he tries to convince Lahar to change his mind and protests that Jello could not even remember what he did, but Lahar refuses, and says ignorance of one's crimes is no excuse and that Jello will either receive execution or life imprisonment. Jello remains calm, accepting his punishment and thanking Urza for everything she has done. Urza looks on helplessly as her long-lost friend is about to be taken away from her permanently just after reuniting. As Urza thinks that she can't let Jello go, Natsu attacks the soldiers, saying he won't allow Jello to be taken away since Jello is one of them now. Natsu tells Jello that he has to stay by Urza's side for her sake, much to Jello's distress, with his new friends exposing themselves and risking their freedom for him, who's resigned to turn himself in. Just as Lahar orders his underlings to arrest them all, after making a terribly difficult decision, Urza cries for them to stop, stating she'll take responsibility herself, and tells them that they can take Jello away, much to his relief. Before being taken into custody, Jello manages to remember one final thing, Urza's surname, Scarlet, stemming from her hair, and openly tells it before bidding farewell to Urza, with her sadly saying the same. Following Hodai and Jello's arrest, the group feels dejected, and Urza is shown sitting alone. She remembers her slave days, when, due to her not having a surname, Jello came up with Scarlet, due to the color of her hair, and says he will never forget her name. She bursts into massive tears and pronouncing Jello's name, starts crying desperately, watching the incoming sunrise bearing the same color as her hair. Joining the friends that were on the Christina and arriving at Kate's shelter, everyone gets new clothes to restore their torn up ones. They meet up with the people of the guild and, after receiving their sincere thanks from Robal, the most exuberant members of Team Light try to celebrate, but then notice Robal upset. Kate Shelter's master goes on to explain that they are not, in fact, the descendants of the Nervit, but the Nervit tribe itself. He explains that 400 years ago, he was the one who created Nirvana to stop the wars raging throughout the country and founded a village on the machine itself, which enjoyed a time of prosperity. However, the darkness that they removed from the targets found its way to the Nervit tribe itself and made the people kill everyone in cold blood, with only Robal managing to escape and eventually dying, just to live on as a spirit. He sealed Nirvana away since he couldn't destroy it himself and settled in an abandoned town to watch over the machine until someone could destroy it. He swore and remained in solitude for some time, until a child with Jello's appearance appeared carrying an unconscious Wendy, asking him to take care of her, to which Robal agreed. Wendy then woke up and asked where she was, since her companion told her that he was going to take her to a guild. Robal, not wanting Wendy to feel sad, said that the place was, in fact, a guild, and used his extremely powerful magic to turn the wrecked town into a guild and create illusory people to be part of it. Now that the burden of Nirvana is destroyed, the guild members start to disappear, and, as Wendy, in despair, is told by Robal that she no longer needs illusory companions, having found real ones. As Robal himself, his task completed, starts disappearing, Wendy runs towards him, but he vanishes before she can reach him, telling her that's just the beginning and that the future awaits her, thanking her newly acquired comrades and asking them to look after her and Carla. Her Kate shelter mark gone from her arm, Wendy desperately cries out for Robal with tears in her eyes, as everyone else stare on silently. Urza kneels behind Wendy, telling her that she knows it's hard to have someone close disappear, but that her comrades will help her bear that sadness. She then invites her back with them to Fairy Tale. Meanwhile, at the Dark Guild Grimoire Hearts headquarters, Alti reports to her master, Hades, that the Oration Says has been defeated. However, Hades doesn't seem to care much about this, and orders Altyr to focus more on finding the key that can open the seal of the Dark Mage Zareph. Altyr then tells her master that she senses something more powerful and dangerous will appear soon. After their battle against Oration Says, Team Natsu is returning home to their guild, along with Wendy and Carla. While Natsu enjoys a brief period of transport without motion sickness, Lucy reminisces about everything that happened after learning the truth about Kate Shelter. She then meets up with Gemini, Scorpio, and Ares, who inform her of Angel's arrest and their nullified contracts. They then proceed by asking her to form a contract with them, surprising the latter. Lucy then shows her kindness to them, making them happy, each in their own way. As the team arrives at Fairy Tale, Wendy and Carla are instantly welcomed by everyone, being glad that Team Natsu managed to arrive back safely. When they learn about Wendy being the Sky Dragon Slayer, Master Makarov announces a welcome party for Wendy and Carla, with Wendy instantly taking a liking to the guild while Carla being somewhat disturbed by the immaturity of it. In the meantime, Gadjil watches from the second floor and complains to see that both the Dragon Slayers have cats while he doesn't. Meanwhile, Misto Gun looks down at the guild from the second floor, surprised to see Wendy arrive at Fairy Tale before disappearing in a gust of wind. A week later, Wendy and Carla are looking for a job on the guild's request board, with Lucy and Levy encouraging them to go on their first job with their respective teams. Meanwhile, Grey approaches Natsu to inform him about a rumor about a woman called Daphne, stating she saw a dragon. After Grey tells Natsu where to find her, the latter leaves immediately, along with Happy. 
Hoping that the dragon could be Grandini, Wendy and Carla decide to join the two as well while Gadjo declines, thinking that the information is false. Concurrently, Urza is shopping for a cake as a welcome gift to Wendy. As she exits the store, she starts to feel an ominous presence. Heading into an alley, Urza finds herself fighting a hooded figure, also using Requip. After clashing swords with Urza, the figure disappears, leaving her confused. Elsewhere, Natsu, Wendy, Happy, and Carla arrive at the inn Grey told them about. After checking most of the rooms, the mages find themselves face to face with a suspicious-looking door. After opening the door, a bespectacled woman appears and reveals herself to be Daphne, thinking all of them are customers for her product, Metamochan. She then continues talking about the product until Natsu gets mad and demands to talk about dragons. Daphne tells Natsu that she lied she saw a dragon, causing Natsu to leave, albeit being unable to do so due to magic of some sort. Natsu tries to punch his way out but only ends up being sent back flying. Wendy opens the window, with the darkness being the only thing she can see. Wendy and Natsu are then surprised to see Grey there, demanding some answers. Grey, however, doesn't answer any of the questions and tells them he has quit his affiliation with Fairy Tail, confusing Natsu and Wendy when Daphne calls him her beloved. Daphne then orders Grey to take Natsu down, with Grey agreeing, ready to settle the rivalry once and for all. Grey initiates the assault by using his ice make, Lance but Natsu is able to dodge his attacks. Grey then strips off his shirt and tells Natsu to be serious. They exchange blows and Natsu tackles Grey into the wall. Daphne explains to Wendy, Happy, and Carla that she and Grey have become partners. They don't believe her at first, thinking that she has Grey under a spell, though she quickly clears their suspicion by saying that he is completely aware of his actions. Grey and Natsu continue their battle, both of them still evenly matched until Grey gains the advantage after they fall into a pool of water. Grey traps Natsu in an ice prison but Natsu breaks out using his dragon's roar, which creates an explosion. Using a smoke to his advantage, Grey is able to land his ice make, Lance on Natsu, sending him flying through the wall. Natsu then breaks the ground they're standing on so they fall down to the first floor. Meanwhile, Urza explains Makarov and the rest of the guild about her assailant, believing it to be a beast, with Juvia subsequently telling them guild about Grey's disappearance. Upon hearing that, Urza and Lucy decide to head out and search for Grey, Natsu, and Wendy. Back at the inn, Happy tries calling for help, albeit to no effect. Daphne then reveals them her concealment magic, which doesn't allow them to leave nor to be found, so Urza and Lucy who just got there are unable to see the inn. Suddenly, the creature that attacked Urza appears again. They then exchange blows and Urza is able to slice off the hood he is wearing, revealing it to be a lizard-like being. Lucy summons Virgo to help Urza, but suddenly another artificial lizardman appears, having the same powers as Virgo. Virgo and the artificial lizardman exchange blows underground and Virgo gets overpowered. Lucy then tells Virgo to retreat and summons Loki instead. The lizardman disappears and another one appears, this one having the same powers as Loki. With Urza beating the lizardman by her quick re-equipping, Lucy summons Plu to beat the lizardman in a comical dance-off. Meanwhile, Grey and Natsu are battling each other, with Natsu being able to smash Grey through the wall. During the battle, Natsu states his desire for answers once, with Grey only mentioning the city without sound. As Natsu goes to check on Grey, he freezes Natsu's feet as Daphne goes over to them and traps him in her hidden darkness. Natsu then remembers about the city without sound as he gets electrocuted. Briefly after, Daphne reveals her Dragonoid and tells Urza and Lucy that the Dragonoid is absorbing Natsu's magic power. Meanwhile, Natsu continues to struggle inside the Dragonoid, only to get electrocuted on every attempt. Back to Daphne, she starts explaining her desire of creating an artificial dragon for a long time having started by hatching artificial dragons from eggs and letting them on a lose on the city she lived in. Due to the people knowing how to use hidden, Daphne forbid them to cancel their magic and thus the people became permanently invisible. Because of that, the city eventually became known as the City Without Sound. In the past, Natsu turned out to have gone to City Without Sound to look for Igniel. At that time, upon arrival in the city, Natsu saw the shadows of the townspeople who were the subjects of Daphne's experiments. Natsu then promised the townspeople that one day he would return to the town and save them. In the meantime, Wendy then tells Urza and Lucy about Grey's betrayal, with him being seen on top of Dragonoid, shocking his fellow guildmates. Urza asks Grey for a reason of his betrayal, with Grey replying that he doesn't have one. Urza then orders Daphne to free Natsu, but she refuses. Daphne tries to check the mobility of her Dragonoid, almost crushing Lucy and Wendy in the process. Suddenly, Elfman, Wakaba, and Makau arrive in their magic four-wheeled vehicle. Elfman then knocks out Grey with a punch to the stomach, while Makau informs Urza that the Master ordered them to capture Grey. The Dragonoid's wings then start to glow as it starts flying in the air, heading straight for Magnolia Town. Urza, Makau, Elfman and Wakaba use the vehicle and try to chase the Dragonoid, 
while Lucy and Wendy are carried by Happy and Carla back to the town. Once the vehicle is under the Dragonoid, Urza tries to jump onto the Dragonoid but is stopped by a Lizardman. She quickly gets rid of it using her black wing armor, but when she gets on top of the Dragonoid she is met up with five of the Lizardmen, each having different Urza's armors. Meanwhile, Elfman, Wakaba, and Makau are stopped by three Lizardmen. Back in Magnolia, Lucy, Wendy, and the rest of the guild are trying to bring all the citizens of Magnolia in the safety of the Fairy Tail Guild. They then catch sight of the Dragonoid coming to Magnolia. Elsewhere, Elfman, Wakaba, and Makau begin their fights against their respective Lizardmen. Wakaba is quickly beaten and Makau is on the brink of defeat when Elfman uses his beast soul to try to protect them all. Meanwhile, Urza is having difficulty beating the Lizardmen. Eventually, Elfman and the others have returned but are injured. Elfman then tells Mira Jane to help Natsu before he collapses. Hana is furious at Grey for his betrayal but Juvia defends him, saying Grey would never betray Fairy Tail. Grey tells her to stop and tells the guild members to take him to Makarov. Grey is then escorted by Alzok and Biska to the Master while Wendy uses her magic to heal Elfman. The whole guild then decides to do their best to save Natsu, but Makarov tells them that they should prioritize saving Magnolia first. While inside the Dragonoid, Natsu hears the voice of someone familiar to him. He then suddenly remembers the promise he made to the people of the city without sound, to defeat the one who controls the dragons. Natsu then begins to release a lot of magic power in order to get out. This causes the Dragonoid to shake a bit, but Daphne just reconfigures it to suck up Natsu's magic power at a more reasonable pace. Meanwhile, Urza continues her fight with the Lizardmen. She then tells Natsu that he is not the type of mage that would lose to the likes of Daphne. Urza then uses her sword magic and vows to bring Natsu back to her. Urza defeats her enemies and attempts to go after Daphne, albeit being too late as the Dragonoid lands in Magnolia. She then falls off the Dragonoid and is about to be stepped on but is saved by her fellow mages. Meanwhile, Makarov confronts Grey to figure out why he betrayed Fairy Tail, with Grey merely stating that only Natsu can defeat the Dragonoid. Urza is then told about the situation and informs Natsu that the Master ordered them to destroy the Dragonoid at all costs. Natsu then tells Urza to destroy the Dragonoid along with him. In the Fairy Tail Guild, Makarov interrogates Grey, wanting to know why he suddenly attacked Natsu. Grey then explains that Daphne told him she was going to capture Natsu and planned to use Natsu as the Dragonoid's power source. Grey then proceeds by saying that he heard that Dragonoid's weakness is the power of the Dragon Slayer. Grey then tells Makarov about his promise to the people from the city without sound he happened to overhear. He then continues by saying that Natsu forgot everything due to only thinking about Igneal. As Grey starts leaving, Makarov halts him and gives him a plan on how to defeat the Dragonoid. Concurrently, Daphne recalls her past as well, having seen a dragon at a young age, wanting to make one herself, even though nobody believed about what she saw. Natsu angrily berates her for going so far, stating that he, Wendy and even Gadgil also want to see their dragons. Daphne, however, simply responds by saying that the dragons are extinct, further expressing her desire to crush the city and fly around the continent. She then starts attacking Magnolia Town with her dragonoid at the expense of Natsu's powers. Grey arrives and gives everyone an outline of what he did, not caring if they believe him or not which made the others forgive and understand him, while at the same time being angry at Natsu for forgetting his promise. He then proceeds to say that they need to do something about Dragonoid first. Urza, having already figured out the plan, proceeds to confront the Dragonoid in her Heaven's Wheel armor, all the while the mages battle the Lizardmen. At the same time, Bixlo reveals that Natsu is close to being fully absorbed by the Dragonoid, while Urza continues to look for the weak spot, fighting off the Lizardmen in every corner. Meanwhile, Grey goes somewhere and asks Juvia to follow him. He then explains to her the importance of their task, with she wondering what's he asking from her. On the rooftop, Grey tells Juvia that the two of them should perform a unison raid. With this, the two mages take each other's hands and begin the attack. As they combine their magic, the unison raid takes place as thousands of icy needles appear, attacking the lizardmen and successfully defeating all of them. However, the dragonoid is still functioning and is going ballistic, with Natsu starting to get irritated with what seems to be two miniature versions of himself who are arguing constantly. Grey, from outside, also contributes to Natsu's irritation by vilifying his abilities, greatly angering him. Happy understands what Grey is doing and supports his doing. Lucy and Urza join as well, causing Natsu's rage to go up as the Dragonoid unleashes a stream of fire into the sky. Urza requips into her purgatory armor and tells him that a dragon would never want to see someone as pitiful as him. With that, Natsu decides to defeat Urza with the power of the Dragonoid as Grey comments on his simple-mindedness. As Natsu tries to attack Urza, she hits the red crest on the Dragonoid's chest, causing Natsu to become enraged and spew out huge amounts of magic power. Daphne realizes that the magic power is exceeding its maximum capacity, and wonders how it could have happened so suddenly. 
Natsu becomes more and more enraged by the minute, telling everyone that he is going to get them back for all the things they've said. Makarov, watching from a distance, acknowledges the power as Natsu's flames of emotion. Back on the ground, Gadgil arrives at the battle, commenting on Natsu's stupidity for allowing himself to get captured. He leaps into the air and attacks the Dragonoid with his Iron God Sword, successfully breaking the red crest on the Dragonoid's chest and opening the path to Natsu. Gadgil tells Lucy to summon Sagittarius and send Natsu all the fire they have. He then states that Daphne has insulted the pride of dragons and tells Natsu to crush her, which he eagerly agrees to do. With that, Levi, Alzok, Biska, Redus, Kana, Makau, and Urza send their fire to Sagittarius, who shoots a flaming arrow to Natsu, who quickly devours it. Makarov states that anger makes Natsu stronger and that his whole plan was to make Natsu angry in order to give him the strength to break out from the Dragonoid. With his power raging, Natsu manages to take down Daphne and just before he delivers the final blow. Daphne, having seen the image of Igniel, expresses her joy after finally seeing a dragon. With his final attack, Natsu utterly destroys the Dragonoid and defeats Daphne, finally breaking the spell over the people in the city without sound, being grateful to Natsu for fulfilling his promise. Gray notes that the weak point of the Dragonoid was also its power source. Natsu immediately berates Gray for causing the mess, though Gray responds that Natsu started it. Lucy notes that no matter how much they may fight, everyone at Fairy Tail needs each other. In the Fairy Tail Guild, Makarov decides to celebrate his guild's work done for the past year with a long awaited Hanami party. A pre celebration begins, and Mira Jane tells everyone to take it easy. All over the guild, everyone is excited for the Hanami party and the annual bingo. However, due to Fairy Tail's resting period, there is a job shortage. Meanwhile, Team Natsu is walking down Mount Hakobe, looking for an herb that can supposedly magnify the magic power of a mage when eaten or drank. As they travel, Lucy and Wendy talk about the upcoming Hanami party inside Horologium while the other three beat up the Vulcans that ambush them. While exploring, Natsu picks up the scent of the herbs and runs towards them, only to find a blizzardvert, a herbivore dragon, with the needed herb as its favorite food. Natsu, Grey, and Urza then successfully draw its attention to them, with Lucy, Wendy, Happy and Carla gathering the herbs. As Lucy gets her hands on some herbs, an avalanche suddenly starts, sweeping everyone away, with Lucy still holding the herbs. At the day of the Hanami, Lucy manages to catch a cold from being buried in the avalanche and thus is unable to attend it. Natsu and Happy leave Lucy's house to let her rest. They feel bad for Lucy since she was really looking forward to the festival. At the festival, everyone is having fun as Natsu explains Lucy's condition to the others. Happy then suggests that Wendy should cast a healing spell on her, but it turns out that Wendy already did and Lucy should be fine by tomorrow. After a while, the traditional Hanami Bingo tournament begins. Everyone, except for Natsu, is participating and attempting to win. Happy tries to persuade Natsu to play bingo, but he refuses. During this time, Lucy lies in her bed at home, thinking about all the experiences she had since the day she met Natsu back at Harjin Town. She wishes that she attended the Hanami. Before she falls asleep, she thanks Natsu and the entire guild for being there for her and concludes that she joined a really great guild. Later that night, Lucy wakes up due to a commotion outside. As she opens the window to check what is going on, she is surprised to see a rainbow secure tree floating on a boat at the river right in front of her house. The next day, Natsu and Happy are happy to hear that Lucy's cold is cured. Afterward, Makarov is asking who was responsible for digging up the rainbow Sakura tree, saying that the mayor is really mad about it. Lucy realizes that it was Natsu and Happy who were responsible, subsequently thanking them and hugging them both. Meanwhile, the people of Magnolia look in wonder as the rainbow Sakura tree seems to be replanted. Sometime later, as Wendy and Carla are looking for a job at the guild request board, Wendy wants to take a job outside of Magnolia. Mira Jane responds by suggesting her a job in Onibus Town, fitting her perfectly. The mentioned job turns out to be from Rabian, who is requesting a person to help him as his actors have abandoned his show. Despite warnings from other members, Wendy decides to accept the job. However, the master is uncomfortable with her going out alone and asks Freed and Happy to go with her. While waiting at Magnolia Station, Wendy and her team discovers that the train that would head to Onibus is not running due to a breakdown. Wendy decides to walk to Onibus despite Happy's protests, though Freed agrees with her. The team begins their trek on the top of the mountain. Wendy, Happy, and Freed are walking together through the forest on their way to Onibus Town. Wendy apologizes to Freed for dragging him into this but Freed shrugs it off, saying that it's for his comrade. As Happy suggests the group to take a rest, Wendy notes that it's about to rain and so the three start looking for a shelter. While Freed wonders whether to use his runes to create a safe area for them, Wendy calls to him from a nearby cave where the three take shelter. Later on, the rain stops but nightfall is approaching, so Wendy decides that the team should camp for the night. 
while they can sleep in the cave they took shelter in. Happy notes that food will be a problem, though Freed says he knows what to do. Upon drawing runes, the winged fish begin to fall from the sky. Though Happy states that the fish tastes awful, Freed tells them he will show them the proper way to prepare the fish. Thorough use of his rapier, Freed skillfully dices the fish and presents it before Wendy and Happy. However, while Freed has no problem eating the fish, Wendy and Happy are not too fond of it. Back at the guild, Lucy tells Urza about Wendy's job. Urza lets Lucy know that she is worried about Wendy and has decided to follow her. When Mira Jane arrives and tells everyone that the train to Onibus isn't running, worried Urza, Lucy, and Carla leave to follow Wendy. Meanwhile, Natsu, who just arrived there, is shocked to hear that Lucy and Urza went after Wendy's group, so he immediately heads for the station and reluctantly boards a train. However, Natsu is going back and forth between Magnolia and Onibus several times due to his motion sickness. In the meantime, Wendy's team is traveling through the desert. When Happy collapses from the heat, Wendy attempts to heal him but seeing her kind nature, Freed steps in and draws a rune barrier to prevent Happy from feeling the heat. Though it seemingly works, Wendy notes it will be pointless when Happy leaves the barrier. Meanwhile, Urza falls into quicksand and so Lucy summons Virgo to help out. As Wendy's group walks along, a cursed sandstorm quickly approaches them, causing them to run away and find Lucy's group. As Virgo tries to lift Urza, she finds that she is unable to do so, all the while the sandstorm is approaching. When Urza is rescued, it seems they cannot run from the sandstorm anymore, but Wendy unleashes her sky dragon's roar to disperse it, earning her compliments from her companions. As the two groups finally reach Onibus, Rabian explains that he made up with his actors and that everything is okay, much to everyone's shock. Everyone, including Natsu, faints from the exhaustion of their long trips. Rabian chastises the fairy tale mages who pass out in front of his theater and orders Wendy to get rid of them, saying that he'll pay a large reward if she agrees to do so. In the end, Wendy is disappointed about her first big job, but Carla tells her she should be proud because she did a very good job. A few days later, it's time for Fairy Tale's annual 24-hour endurance race and everyone in the guild gets ready for it. Jet, the winner of the previous year's race, plans on winning again in order to impress Levy. Fairy Tale members have to run to the mountain to get a wyvern scale and return to Magnolia's South Gate Park within 24 hours. Whoever comes in last place will receive the punishment from the guild master. Happy and Evergreen get shocked upon hearing about the rule of no flying due to many complaints received over the past years. Shortly after, the race then begins and so everyone takes off, while Jason from Sorcerer Magazine comes to watch and commentate the race. When the race starts, Jet's high-speed magic initially puts him far ahead of his competitors as he takes off quickly. Natsu, however, uses his Fire Dragon's Iron Fist to give himself a speed boost. With that, the rest of the guild takes off as well, including Wendy and Carla, who apologize to Lucy and Levy for leaving them behind. When Makarov reminds them of the awaiting punishment, the girls quickly get going as well. Along with Jason reporting, Mira Jane and Makarov take note of where everyone in the race is, though Mira Jane realizes that Jet is so fast that they can't film him. While running in the race, Redus uses his picked magic to make a hole in front of him, which Warren and Droy fall into. As Redus tries to repeat the process, he is passed and knocked into his own hole by Gagil. In an attempt to take the lead, Grey creates an ice make, which causes Vigitor, Nab and many others to lose their balance and fall down. As Grey attempts to get in the lead, Elfman uses his beast arm to knock him back, much to Juvia's surprise. Elsewhere, Kana and Wakaba are neck and neck, both commenting on how the other is having trouble running, at which point Makao shows up and passes both of them. Near the mountains, Evergreen steps on a trap set by Freed and actives his rune trap, inadvertently trapping Biska and Max along with her. As Evergreen gets angry at her fellow Thunder God tribe member, Freed himself appears as a number of textbooks materialize. He states that to exit the trap, they need to answer some questions and get all of them correct, much to their anger. Later on the mountain, Urza narrowly avoids one of Freed's traps and surrounds him with her swords as punishment for ruining her running rhythm. Meanwhile, Jet manages to secure a wyvern scale for himself far before anyone else can do so and heads back down the mountain back to Magnolia, with the commentators expressing their opinions on his speed. At the same time, Lucy decided to take a break because she was too tired to run. Lucy then got a brilliant idea by asking Virgo to help carry her to her destination. Virgo obeys Lucy's orders and immediately run as fast as possible. Elsewhere, Wendy, Carla, and Grey are wondering where Juvia has disappeared, while being revealed that Juvia has merged with the water as she sadly watches Grey pass her by. In the nighttime, Natsu is reaching the top of the mountain but is running low on magic power. Luckily, after being passed and knocked away by Gadgil, Natsu comes across some campers and asks to eat their fire, greatly replenishing his magic power. Numerous guild members have managed to secure their wyvern scales and begin the trip down the mountain and back to the park, 
On the other hand, Happy is unable to obtain a scale due to his short stature and the restriction on flight. However, Natsu arrives and hands him a scale and the two of them head back down. The second half of the race gets underway with Jet in the lead, followed by Urza, Grey, Lucy and Gadgil. Another pack of mages who are further back are still running, determined not to lose. However, Jet decides to take a nap to make things more interesting. A while later, he is found and woken up by Happy, who makes him realize that he overslept, resulting in him taking off at full speed. Approaching Magnolia, Urza, Grey, Natsu and Gadgil are hastily making their way into town. As they get closer, Jet, running at full speed, shows up and eagerly attempts to overtake them, surprising everyone who believed he already had the lead. With his arrival, the five racers eagerly attempt to overtake one another, all with little success. However, just as they approach the finish line, Natsu trips and makes the other four trip over him right in front of the finishing line. Happy is then seen in the distance running towards the finish line. Happy manages to cross the line, followed by Wendy and Carla. By doing so, Happy wins the first place, followed by Wendy, who wins second place, and Carla, who wins the third place. While Urza, Gadgil, Natsu, Grey and Jet are still down, the rest of Fairy Tail quickly crosses the finishing line, along with Urza, having recovered rather quickly. In the end, it is Grey, Natsu, Jet and Gadgil who are the only ones left. Jet realizes this and gets back up and runs off. Grey, Natsu and Gadgil grab onto Jet and cross with him, making the end a tie. All of them request for the race again but Makarov reveals that since it's a tie, all of them must share the punishment. The punishment is that they must dress up like girls and have an interview and a photo spread printed in the Weekly Sorcerer magazine. Grey, Natsu, Gadgil and Jet are all shocked and refuse to do such a thing, running off into the distance, with Jason running after them. Meanwhile, Happy asks what his prize is, to which Makarov replies that his prize is the admiration of his fellow guild mates, much to his disappointment. A few days later, the town and the guild learn of Guildarts' return, with most of the new members unaware of what's going on until they learn that Guildarts is currently the strongest mage of fairy tale, and that he had just returned from a century quest after three years. Following the announcement of Guildarts' return, the town immediately sets up the town to be separated for a path straight to fairy tale called Guildarts' Shift. This is due to his magic crush which destroys everything that he touches. When Guildarts arrives at the guild, he is surprised to see how much the building and some of his friends had changed. Natsu then, without hesitation, charges toward him for a fight but gets beaten with just one throw. Guildarts later talks with Makarov about the mission and says that he couldn't finish it, greatly shocking everyone since he is their strongest mage. He later leaves for his home, but tells Natsu to come over since he has something to tell him before accidentally destroying a wall while leaving. Happy and Natsu head toward Guildart's home and the first thing he asks is about Natsu's relationship with Lysana, with Natsu quickly becoming upset and telling him that she died two years ago before proceeding to leave, until Guildart stops him and tells him about meeting a black dragon and how that dragon forced him to quit the Hundred Year Mission. Natsu tries to run away, since he believes that the black dragon might know where Igniel is and how he could find him. But Guildart's attempts to stop him, showing him the severe injuries he received when the dragon attacked him. When he tells Natsu that no human could defeat the dragon, Natsu angrily exclaims that he's called a dragon slayer for a reason and then runs off. Meanwhile, Makarov, who was alone, was seen pondering poor Yusuka's words about the three dragon slayers in fairy tale and the fate that brought them together. This is the end of the second part of the anime.